Now on BBC One, Wednesday's edition of Tonight. Good evening from Westminster, where at just after 10 past 10, MPs are at this moment voting in the division lobbies on tonight's crucial and perhaps historic motion of no confidence in Jim Callaghan's Labour government. If the Prime Minister goes down to defeat in the next quarter of an hour, and the latest indications suggest it's still very much on the knife edge, he'll be the first holder of his office to be forced into a general election by a Commons vote since Ramsay MacDonald in 1924. And the election campaign then following would be, in the eyes of many, the most significant since the epoch-making contest of 1945. Not only because the election of 79 seems likely to offer the British people an unusually sharp choice, at least between the two major parties, but also because it could lead to the emergence of Mrs Thatcher as Britain's first woman Prime Minister. But just for the moment, of course, our most urgent concern is with the vote now taking place. We'll be giving you first news of the result at about 10.20 and bringing you reaction from politicians, including Mr Michael Foote, Mr Francis Pym and Mr John Pardo. Leading up to this vote, and indeed sometimes overshadowing this debate, have been seemingly endless speculations about the voting intentions of those smaller parties and even some individual MPs who held the balance of power tonight. And the latest intelligence on this front is that one Ulster Unionist, Mr Harold McCusker, has in fact at the very last minute been won over to support the government, which may put Mr Callaghan within real reach of safety. The main point here today, though, is that if rumours were votes, they'd still be adding up the final figures at midnight. Fortunately, the guessing will stop much sooner than that. And I now hand you over to the BBC commentary box inside the chamber, where David Holmes has been following the debate today and gauging the developing mood of MPs. David. Well, Donald, uh, inside the House, uh, as you've said, the rumours have been flying fast, and the latest rumour uh, has, has very recently been confirmed as fact, as you've said, that uh, a certain uh, Ulstermen, and particularly Mr McCusker, uh, have changed their allegiance at the last moment. And it now seems certain that this debate might end in a tie, in which case we'd be left with uh, a very interesting situation of the Speaker having to give his casting vote and giving it traditionally uh, with the government not for the government but with them but that would mean that the government would win of course or that the government might uh, even win by a majority of one uh, it seems that uh, the fact that Mr McCusker has decided to come over to vote with the government uh, is much to do with talks which have been going on between Mr Hattersley, the Prices Secretary, uh, Mr McCusker, uh, and Mr Carson, another Ulster Unionist MP who decided some days ago that he would vote with the government. Apparently Mr Hattersley promised uh, an examination by the Prices Commission into the prices of energy and foodstuffs in Northern Ireland, uh, and the report is promised by July the 1st. And Mr McCusker has, I understand, just confirmed in an interview with the BBC that he is going to vote with the government. Well, with all this, the atmosphere is really pretty tense because we've been thinking all along that the government would lose tonight. I don't think I've ever seen the House as full and attentive as it has been during uh, these closing speeches. The first of the closing speeches was by Mr William Whitelaw, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Uh, he uh, concentrated on the need for an early election. His was a very combative speech with a stormy opening in which he particularly attacked Mr Callaghan. Today he gave some classic examples of his cover-up technique. He waxed eloquent about support, not sabotage. But the Prime Minister knows all about sabotage. He was the man who sabotaged his own colleagues in a place of strife in 1969, including the Right Honourable Lady for Blackburn. He was the man who sabotaged my right honourable friend for Bexley Sidcup when he was seeking to control inflation in 1974 yeah, yeah, yeah. with his disgraceful with his dis, with his disgraceful incitement of the miners at Aberdeen. Mr. Foote it was who closed the debate for the government. He was uh, in his best uh, debating form with Mr. David Steele, the Liberal leader, a special target for his wit, particularly Mr. Steele's present association with Mrs. Margaret Thatcher. 
what the Right Honourable Lady has done, and I've seen it, marked it myself. What she is doing today is uh, leading her troops into battle, snugly concealed behind a Scottish nationalist shield, with the boy David holding her hand. <laughs> I could say to the Right Honourable Lady, I'm even more concerned about the fate of the Right Honourable Gentleman than I am about her. Uh, she can look after herself. <laughs> but uh, here, the leader of the Liberal Party, uh, yeah, I'd say this in the utmost affection, but he's, uh, he's, uh, he's passed from rising hope to elder statesman without any intervening period whatsoever. <laughs> Well, the chamber, of course, is now uh, not, hasn't got any activity in it at all. It's pretty full, but it is waiting for the result of the division. Now, after Mr. Foote spoke, the House uh, did divide, went into this division. The Speaker calling for the vote as usual. Eyes to the right, nose to the left. Uh, there's just, in fact, as I'm speaking, been a great cheer from uh, the House and it does appear as though the government may have won, although we're not yet in a position to bring you the vote. But anyway, eyes to the right and nose to the left, the Speaker said. So the Conservatives and their supporters have been filing out into the eye lobby, and there behind the government benches on our left to be counted, whilst these supporting the Prime Minister have entered the no lobby behind the opposition benches. And in a few minutes now, a very few minutes, the House will, will uh, gather together and uh, we shall hear the result. When the tellers return, in a few minutes from now, they'll announce the results. If the ayes have it, Mrs. Thatcher will have won. If the noes have more votes, then Mr. Callaghan will have survived this vote of confidence. But in fact, before any announcement takes place, we will know the answer because the two pairs of tellers take up places in front of the mace and the winning pair will take their place on our right. So when the tellers come in, there'll be a great roar as the House sees where they stand. And in the event of a tie, then government and opposition tellers will stand alternately, uh, side by side, uh, together. So while we wait for all that to happen, and now the tellers are with us, and the conservative tellers are standing on the right, and therefore it is quite clear that the government have been defeated, the government have been defeated, and the conservatives have won. Order. 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 The eyes to the right, 311. The nose to the left, 310. So the Conservatives have won by one vote. The vote is now taken to the, chief, to the Speaker, who's going to read the votes again. Conservative benches are standing, waving order papers. The Speaker shouting for order. Order. The eyes to the right, 311. The nose to the left, 310. So the eyes have it. The eyes for the vote of no confidence. The vote of no confidence is won. The Prime Minister straight away gets to his feet and comes to the dispatch box, waiting for the cheering, or the jeering, really, from the other side to subside. Mr. Speaker. Now that the House of Commons has declared itself, we shall take our case to the country. Yeah. Tomorrow, I shall propose to Her Majesty that this House be dissolved, that Parliament be dissolved, as soon as essential business can be cleared up. And I will then uh, announce as soon as may be, and that will be as soon as possible, the date of dissolution the date of the election, and the date of meeting of the new parliament. Yeah. Prime Minister sits down. Mrs Thatcher comes to the dispatch box to great Conservative cheers from behind her. Many Conservatives standing and waving their order papers. She's standing quite calmly there. Mr Speaker, as the government no longer has authority to carry on business without the agreement of the opposition, may I make it quite clear 
that we shall facilitate any business which requires the agreement of the opposition so that the dissolution can take place at the very earliest opportunity and the uncertainty be over. He sits down and the speaker now rises to his feet. Expenditure! The motion on expenditure. So the House moves on without further ado to its other business. The Prime Minister gets up to cheers, some cheers from his own side, but as Mrs Thatcher leaves the chamber, the whole of the Conservative side of the House uh, rise to their feet and cheer her uh, out of the chamber. We can be sure now that there will be a great deal of uh, preparatory work to be done on that side for the election that is now definitely with us. And so it is on the government side. As the Prime Minister said, he must see the Queen probably pretty early tomorrow and put to her his proposals for the date of the election. The date of the election, which most of us expect to be in early May. May the 3rd has been a date much talked about today, but for discussion back in the studio on all of this, I hand you now back to Bob McKenzie. Well, uh, a great moment in the history of the island because not since 1841, as the simple motion, this house has no confidence in Her Majesty's government, been passed. 55 years ago, it was almost that. Uh, an issue was put, which was called an issue of confidence, but it is really now 170 80 years since exactly that motion was passed and by the way by exactly the same majority in 1841 this is 311 310 it was a one majority in 1841 so it's obviously an historic moment now i've got with me uh, first of all lord carrington leader of the tories in the, in the house of lords lord carrington your reaction well i think that uh, what we've seen over these last few days in the wheeler dealing the people's votes trying to be swayed one way or the other has really meant that whatever happened the government couldn't survive i think that what we were really seeing decided tonight was not whether there was going to be a general election but whether there was going to be a general election straight away or a general election in a few weeks and i think it's absolutely right from the country's point of view that this decision has been taken that we're going to have a general election i don't think we could have gone on like this and i think it's really been very, a very unedifying spectacle, what we've been observing over these last few days. And you've no objection to the Prime Minister saying we shall take our case to the country, we'll recommend, he sees the Queen in the morning, we recommend as early a date as possible, which presumably, we'll talk about dates in a moment, is the end of April, beginning of May. Yes, I, I don't know that the Prime Minister said an, as, as early a date as possible. Certainly I think that there ought to be as early a date as possible. I think it is very important that the election should take place as soon as possible and this uncertainty should be stopped. And as far as you're aware, is your party wholly geared up to fighting a campaign that may be three or four weeks, four weeks away? Well, we were ready in October. We thought we were going to have an election in October. So we're ready for the campaign. I think from our point of view, if you look at it, I mean, if you look at the opinion polls and so on, I think probably this is a better moment for my party to have an election than it was in October. And I think we enter into it very well prepared and very confident. Well, let's have a look at those polls, because suddenly... Um, unreliable as they are, and nobody has done more to warn people against polls, I almost take the view that opinion polls should be required to carry across them the sort of thing that appears on a, on a page of cigarettes, you know, mm. beware. Uh, here are the polls, uh, one of them, perhaps the most prestigious, but not necessarily the most accurate, but perhaps the most prestigious. And look at what's been happening over the last period almost of a year. Now look at this. Conservatives, 45 Labour 43. August last year, 43, 47. Labour lead. That was going into the moment when Jim Callaghan decided not to hold an election. Then 49, 42. Then October 42, 47. Labour again in the lead. 48, Labour in the lead November to 43. December, reversing. L uh, Conservatives, 48, 42. Now, stop for a moment. I treat that as bracketing equal all the way. Remember, each figure is subject to a three-point move in either way. And therefore, any figure is subject to a three-point variation. Suddenly in February, as you'd expect, in the great cri industrial crisis situation, the Tories leap ahead, 53-33, and the last Gallup poll was Tories 51-37. Some slight evidence of tightening up again. But the key point I want to make is the polls where when Jim Callaghan might have called the election last October, 
looking quite well in his favor, and therefore, uh, I think it's quite wrong to assume that it's a foregone conclusion, because this is obviously the immediate reaction to the industrial disputes of that time. And there's no reason whatever, in my view, to assume uh, that there's any necessary certainty about the outcome. Uh, certainly, the Tories ought to move into the election favorites, but we can see the strength of the Labour position. And what's very odd is that for a very long time, the Tories were actually um, only a few points ahead of Labour and sometimes behind them, and Labour was actually scoring more on the opinion polls than they did at the last election. So we enter, really, an exciting contest in which no one should say it's a foregone conclusion. Yeah. Now, I want to turn to Lord Diamond, former uh, Labour minister and peer. How do you see your chances, and um, what's your reaction to the news? Well, I think everybody <coughs> will feel pleased that the period of uncertainty is over. You welcome the election, indeed. I welcome the opportunity of demonstrating what the people of this country have faith in and what they want to do. An election does that. An election is not an opportunity for expressing distaste with some things that are going on. That's what you see expressed in the February polls. An election is a much more difficult choice of what you stand for, not what you stand against. And therefore, moving on a bit, I think it is still a very open question as to what the people of this country want. It's a good thing to give them the opportunity to say what it is, I doubt if anybody could say with any certainty what the likely result yeah. is going so to be. So we've got then agreement that it now is time and it's going to happen and it's either the end of April, early May, and no one's going to cavil about the fact that the British public will now be asked to decide. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, over to Donald now. And here at uh, Westminster Central Hall, we are still waiting in the rain for front benchers to make their way over and join us from the House of Commons. In the meantime, with me now are two distinguished and leading political journalists, Bergen Western of the Observer and John Cole of the sorry, Bergen Western of the Sunday Telegraph and John Cole of the Observer. First of all, gentlemen, your initial reactions, Perry. I'm very glad that the House of Commons made the right decision. Were you surprised at the result after all the wheeling and dealing and speculation? I thought, I thought that the government would be defeated. And uh, I'm glad for once to have my expectations fulfilled. John Cole, what about uh, your expectations? Well, I assumed that the government would be defeated, but there was a lot of last minute coming and going between government whips and junior ministers and so on, particularly with the Irish members. And there were some rumours of changes, and we haven't heard the confirmed voting arrangements yet, but clearly it wasn't enough to preserve the government, though rather close. And what do you think, John, about the date of the next general election now that it's been decided on? Well, even before the vote tonight, this afternoon, the Prime Minister said that the, the country would have an opportunity of voting in the next, in the very near future, I think was the phrase he used. Clearly, there's going to be an election, I would think now, in May. The favoured date talked in Westminster tonight is the 3rd of May, but that does coincide with the local government elections, and I have a slight feeling in my own mind that it might be more probable that it will be the 10th. When Mr. Callaghan did say, as you've reminded us, that he was going to go for an early election anyway, what date do you think he would have preferred? Oh, I think a date in May, but possibly June the 7th, if he could have held out that long until to coincide with the European elections. Yeah, uh, Peregrine Worson, do you think there's any, any chance that Mr. Callaghan might somehow, uh, resourceful politician that he is, manage to spin things out until June the 7th, in spite of tonight's defeat? I would have thought all the pressures would be upon him. I don't know what, what, what role the, um, the Queen's advisers have in this. I think to postpone the election beyond a certain point would be, we don't have a constitution, but I think this would be unusual and discreditable. I would have thought that uh, the message from the palace would be, let's get it over and let's not try and uh, procrastinate. John says May the 3rd or 10th, what do you say? I think May the 10th for the reasons that John says <coughs> about the local elections. The argument used against that, of course, is that uh, if the Labour Party had a bad result in the local elections on the 3rd of May, it would be demoralising. But on the other hand, it is said that this year, because the Conservatives did rather well three years ago, Labour stands not to lose many seats in the local elections, so it might, on the other hand, be a morale booster for them. So I think the 10th is quite a probable date, but we'll know tomorrow. Mind you, the Conservatives have been saying they would like the earliest possible election, by which they mean the 26th of April. Is that practical or feasible at all, do you think? 
I have summed out the Prime Minister immediately after uh, the division and result was announced said that they would put the remaining business, which means the budget and the finance bill, through as expeditiously as poss okay. possible. I don't think it terribly matters whether it's one week earlier or one week later. <coughs> I, I think that uh, as soon as tonight is over, what we'll get, have to get on to discussing is the issues of the election, what we're going to be talking about, what we're going to be debating about, and. Uh, who we want to win. Finally, gentlemen, as Bob McKenzie has been reminding us, uh, this is the start of the campaign, really, today. Mm. What was your judgment of the comparative performances of the two leaders in the House of Commons this afternoon, Perry? I thought it was a very um, good uh, reflection of how the campaign is going to be fought, and one can see the strengths of the Prime Minister. He's a formidable performer. He looks solid and reassuring, as we've been told countless times. And Mrs. Thatcher doesn't yet have those uh, particular forensic or uh, oratorical gifts, no question about that. I think though her message is coming across. She says it calmly, not very eloquently, but I think it's coming across. Quick last comment from you, John. Well, I thought Mrs Thatcher was better than most people in the press gallery did, but I thought the Prime Minister's response was a formidable one, and he will be a formidable yeah, campaigner, perhaps the best Labour Prime Minister in recent times on the hustings. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And now uh, inside to another and perhaps drier part of the same forest and Robin Day. Well, the government has been defeated by one vote after this vote of no confidence. And here is Mr. Francis Pym of the Conservative front bench, Shadow Foreign Secretary. And uh, what do you say, Mr. Pym? Well, by the narrowest of margins, admittedly, the House of Commons has decided that it is indeed time the country had an election, that the issues were put to the people, that this parliament has had its day, and that a new parliament and a new government with a fresh mandate from the people should be elected. That's the essence of it. Do you know why the margin was only one rather than uh, the two or three which uh, many people expected? Well, I think it only was expected to be one or two, but uh, there were one or two abstentions. There were uh, a certain division amongst the Irish members, but at any rate, it, it, the cookie crumbled by a majority of one, and I think that had been predicted actually for most of the day, but nobody quite knew upon which side the one would fall. I gather the Labour Party had, the government had two Ulster Unionists in its lobby, which reduced the majority to one. Is that that's, roughly right? That's quite right. They had also one of their own members who was too ill to come. We had a complete turnout, so did the Liberal Party, so did the Scottish Nationalist Party, and the Welsh Nationalists voted uh, all three of them for the government. Well, the Lord President of the Council, Mr Foote, has just joined us, but before I come to him, when do you expect the election to be, date-wise, not as soon as possible? Yes, I should have thought the 26th of April uh, would probably be right now, conceivably the 3rd of May, but uh, uh, possibly the, th the 26th of April, because Mr Callaghan said that he would make a statement very soon indeed about how quickly a parliament would be dissolved and what the date of the election would be. And Mrs Thatcher said, the sooner it is done, the better. And I think the House of Commons would agree that the sooner it is done, the better. Mr Foote, thank you for joining us. Uh, is this, are you relieved by this result? Disappointed though you may be? Well, we expected that we would, uh, might lose. And, uh, you know, we've fully reconciled to the fact. And of course, uh, we are prepared now for the election and we think we've got every chance of winning. And when will that be? Well, it isn't decided yet, but uh, we take into account these factors. I doubt very much whether it can be done by the 26th of April, but, you know, the Prime Minister will do what he said in the House of Commons this evening. He will make an announcement to, to the House of Commons very soon, um, after what, consultation with others. Yes. Um, what are the objections, actually, to having it on April the 26th? Well, Is it a, just Easter and the well, budget? Well, that's one of the reasons. It would be a terrible scramble to do it on that date, and I doubt very much whether anyone who looks at the details can see that that's the most sensible date. But at any rate, uh, the thing is open, as he said, and uh, I think that's better for people to look at it before anybody makes a commitment. And the procedure is that the Prime Minister will see the Queen tomorrow, advise yes. the dissolution, and then announce the dates accordingly? Well, he probably will make a statement to the House of Commons tomorrow. Whether he actually announces the date tomorrow, I don't know, but I should think very likely. Um, Mr Pardo, what is your reaction to tonight's vote in which your party voted against the government? Well, we're naturally pleased to win. We're pleased to be on the winning side. Uh, not often, are you? Oh, yes, quite often, you know. We were on the winning side for most of the Lib Lab Pact, you may remember. Very good government it was too, Robin. But the important thing is not for us is not actually the general election. That's a, a little matter that's going to have to be decided in three or four weeks. There's a much more important election tomorrow in Edge Hill. And uh, we think we're going to win it. And uh, are you surprised that the government has been defeated tonight? No, I'm not at all surprised. No, I obviously realised it was going to be a very close-run thing. 
But I think that it's right that there should be a general election. I think that that's actually the mood of the country, and I think that really was, in their heart of hearts, the mood of most government supporters. I what's, think your, should uh, be one. what's your answer to the Prime Minister's taunt today to the Liberal Party, that they said they were in favour of further talks about devolution to keep the thing alive, and then they vote the only way in which it prevents it from being kept alive? Look, we've been talking about devolution for a very, very long time, haven't we? I think it's far better to have a general election, get a new mandate, and then we can have the talks about the future. When do you think it will be? Or when do you think it ought to be, having heard what Mr. Pym and Mr. Foote have said. Well, I take Michael's point that uh, April the 26th is probably rather hasty, bearing in mind uh, Easter, but then May the 3rd has similar disadvantages because it obscures the whole local government thing. What about that, Mr. Foote? Can confused. you hold an, a general election on the same day as a local government election, which has never been done before? No, you certainly could do so. Uh, you'd have to get the agreement of the House of Commons to do it. Of would course. it need legislation? I think it would, yes. And I think that, but I think that's the most sensible thing, probably, although... Uh, I don't, uh, there are several other factors to be taken into account, and I think those factors should, the government should have time to look at them, the opposition to have a little time to look at them, but uh, to decide it uh, very speedily. But to the, certainly I think May the 3rd has got, uh, you know, there's a case for it as well. Would the Conservative opposition be prepared to cooperate in passing special legislation to enable the election to take place on May the 3rd, if the government asks for that? Well, I think the idea of legislation, or any more legislation in this parliament, uh, of a primary kind, is, is really almost un unthinkable. And obviously we'd have to consider that, but I, I think it's really very unlikely that... Well, primary legislation, that's... Isn't legis it? Well, that, no, that, well, primary leg it's legislation that would arise from the decision of the House of Commons Is it an today. order or is it a bill? No, it'd be a bill, I think. And I don't see well, why the House of Commons shouldn't do it, because uh, that would be a way of arranging it so that the House of Commons can deal with the other matters that uh, the Leader of the Opposition... I mean, I suppose if all, parties, with, yes, if all parties would... Have, obviously, you know, there's if, got to be discussions about it, and I think that the matter will be resolved. On a I don't think it really matters basis. what date it's on. I, I think well, it must uh, matter to some extent. No, no, I don't extent. think it matters, but frankly, a bit. I think this is one of these sort of academic discussions that we politicians indulge in, and the public couldn't care... He to thinks that Ed Shield is more important. I don't think it, it matters. Really I don't think it matters oh. when the date is. I mean, it's, it's obviously going to be the 26th, the 3rd, or the 10th. I mean, it's got to be on a Thursday, basically. We all agree that. So it's going to be one of those. And basically, the thing is now, what are the issues before us? Well, that was just the next question I was going to ask. Well, I'm, I'm so most glad. grateful to I'm you very for, glad. For, for, for taking the uh, discussion along. Answer it. Well, I think the issues are obviously going to be, do we believe that a return to two-party politics, the old sort of rip-roaring two-party fight which uh, takes place at the hustings, whether that really is going to solve Britain's problems? And frankly, I think there are a very, very large number of moderate centre people in Britain who, looking objectively at the record of the last four years, Labour government, and the record of the Conservative government before it, will say, a plague on both your houses. You cannot possibly have confidence in either single-party government to work for Britain. Mr Pym, what do you do well, in response to that? We're miles away from having any other kind of government. We've gone down a road for the last five years, which hasn't exactly been a, a tearing success. And what I think the country wants is, in fact, a clear choice. Quite true, the Liberals there will be trying to get the vote in the centre. But I think a lot of centre people have become a little bit disillusioned with it by the attempt to try to stay to the centre. And now we can, in British politics, you never go very far away from the centre, the one side or the other. But the direction of state takeovers and nationalisation and the imposition of more bureaucracies and all the rest of it has, I think, got on the, under the skin of people. They're absolutely fed up with the, the way things are going at the moment. And they do want a clear break a clean break and to start on a new basis and I think the election will be fought as it is normally fought on the issues of the economy, on housing, on unemployment and inflation, all the great issues that affect everybody in their daily lives. There was and one I sentence in Mrs Thatcher's speech this afternoon which caught my ear as a possible slogan which might uh, be waved above um, Tory uh, uh, candidates, namely less taxes Less taxation and more law and order, I think was her phrase. Do you see that as a good slogan? Uh, well, I don't know whether it's a good slogan, but I'm sure it's a very sound policy which most people, however they vote, would like. I think they'd also like to pay less taxes, I may say. like to have less government and less interference with their lives. I think that is a theme that will but strike the chord in the hearts of a great many theme, people. If well, that so is the some politicians policy. just come along and say what they think people would like to hear. And, of course, the two phrases that you quoted are exactly fall into that category. I don't believe the political problems that face this country can be summarized in that way. I think anybody who tries to pretend that you can summarize the polit pol political choices facing the country in that way is misleading the British people. And of course, I think the British people 
pretty adult lot. I think they'll see through it if somebody just goes and says, we're going to reduce all your taxes, solve all your problems, put, uh, pay more to the police, incidentally. That's, that's higher taxes, not lower taxes. So I think people will see through that. And I think it's very foolish for them to have launched their election campaign on a, a number of silly slogans that will hang around their neck, because the British people much more intelligent than Mrs. Thatcher gave them credit for in the House of Commons today. But nonetheless, right. Mr. Foote, uh, slogans and uh, summarized messages have always played yeah. their part in political campaigns, and you yourself have exactly. fought on the slogans I've put written back to work and... and, and uh, the great expert. Up, and all these things, uh, they, they summarize and, and en encapsulate issues which yes. inform people. What's wrong with slogans? Well, I'm not saying that slogans are wrong. It depends which slogans you use. Well, what slogans well, I you tell use? Well, I say, I'm re replying exactly to your question, if you say that the slogans on which this election should be fought are less taxes and more law and order, I say those slogans are foolish and silly because, in fact, they slur over the real problems. You see, the real problems of the British people are not going to be solved by just less taxes. <laughs> you can have more unemployment if you have less taxes, and all those complicated questions. Now, the British people, I believe, over the election, will listen carefully to many of these arguments and debates. And of course, we will accept, must accept, the decision of the British people in that argument. But don't start off the campaign by saying those wonderful slogans that she recited there are the things that are going to sway the British people. That is to treat the British people with contempt. And anyone who does that makes a big mistake. Mm, Tapado, what do you think uh, the liberal message will be? A halt to the decline of Britain as an economic and industrial power and uh, our influence in the world. And I think that you have to look back over the period that we've had since the war, realize that we've had now just 34 years and 17 of those have been governed by Labour governments and 17 been governed by Conservative governments and they've been a period of pretty rapid decline in almost all sectors for Britain. And I think that the time has come to call a halt and I don't think that that can be done simply by switching from one government to another. I think that you've got to find a new way of governing Britain. What's economically necessary in Britain today is politically impossible and we have to make it politically possible and that means major and fundamental constitutional and political changes and only a vote for a new kind of political party in, in British politics can do that. And the Liberal Party is a new kind of political party? Yes, indeed, because we are not aiming to govern this country by the sort of single party system of switching from one to the other that the other two parties are, are advocating. But if I may say so, in an election, accepting your argument, uh, in an election people cannot vote for a new kind of system. They can only vote for candidates from a particular party. No, Robin, that is just where you're wrong. And I think that that is where, in fact, some po politicians in the other parties are going to make a mistake. They can vote for a new system. They can vote for a new way of governing Britain. We showed a new way of governing Britain in the Lib Lab Pact. And we are going to go to the country and we are going to say, look at the record of that 18 months. In that 18 months, by the standards of the other parties, inflation, stable pound, or all these things, it was in fact the best and most successful 18 months of government that we've had in the last 15 Why years. Why have you voted to turn them out tonight? But because we had come to the end of our ability to agree with Labour on government. Mr. Pitt, we did it for 18 yeah. months and we said to the Prime Minister, that's it, put it to the country. And he didn't do it. He should have done it in the autumn when we told him. Well, Mr. Pym, what is your response to that my, and what Mr. My, Foote has been saying? My response to that is that the Lib Lab Pact was formed shortly after the IMF moved in to take over the control of this country's economy. Oh. And when this government had to take measures, which we've been advocating for a long time, and it began that period of improvement which enabled the Liberal Party to claim that the Lib Lab Pact was a very successful period. That's my answer to that. Uh, as to Mr. Foote's comments, I actually agree that slogans are not going to solve anything problems are much too difficult for that. And I take encouragement from the recent referendum campaign in Scotland and Wales that the people of this country most certainly are going to attend very carefully to the arguments that are going to be adduced, the arguments for and against the pro proposals that will be made by the parties to the country on all the key issues. They certainly listened to the arguments in the referendum recently, and I'm sure they're going to do it again because people are worried, they are concerned about the fall in our reputation abroad. They are concerned about their worries at home, all of them. And I think they are going to listen to the arguments. And that, I think, is a very, very good thing. And it's one of the reasons why, in my view, the House of Commons did vote tonight, albeit very narrowly, by one, to say, we must have those arguments before the people of this country now. And let's get on with it and start on a new leaf, 
having listened to those arguments and made our choice. What would you say, and I'll put this question by name, Mr. Foote and Mr. Pardo also, what would you say to a voter during the campaign who says, yes, I want to study the issues, yes, I find it very difficult to make up my mind because no government has succeeded in solving our problems and indeed both governments have run into very serious troubles. Your claims and counterclaims do not impress me. What will be the issue which you hope will, will, uh, will sway such a floating intelligent voter? Well, I hope the manner in which and the intelligence with which and the intellectual quality of the arguments that are adduced, I think the people of this country are very intelligent and in an instinctive way they appreciate what is being said genuinely. They do see, th see through things that are being misrepresented. And I think that if the argument is very hardly argued, as I'm sure it will be, that in their instinct and <coughs> in their conscious mind they will vote in a way that will be decisive and will reflect what their view is. What do you say to that question? <laughs> well, I'm very glad we've converted Francis Bim even on this program. He started off reciting the rather foolish slogan, I thought, of Mrs. Thatcher, and now we've you converted him. You, no, no, you we've converted... No, you he was listening to that. I listen to what I have to say for half a second, you know. <laughs> we, 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 we started off by reciting her rather foolish slogan, and now we've converted him to the idea that it's a much bigger and longer argument than that. I think that's a very good thing. So we made a good start. And over the next four or five weeks, right, there will be a longer point. argument, and uh, right, the people will go into it more deeply, and I think the more deeply they go into it, they will see that what we've got to do is have a great reconstruction of the country, particularly dealing with the challenge to people's jobs. I think that's what is uppermost in lots of people's minds, and I believe as the argument goes ahead, it's not a question of slogans. It's a question of debate between political parties that have serious fundamental differences in their outlook. And that's why I think the liberal comment is doesn't re isn't really relevant, because there is a fundamental difference between the parties, and the people have got the right to choose, and uh, I'm all in favor of their choosing. Of you course. think the high-level approach of Mr. Pym and Mr. Foote to the campaign will materialize, and will you support it? No, I think they've started the campaign already in exactly the way I want it to continue. I want them to have a great bust-up for three okay. weeks, and we will be the voice of reason and common sense. I think the British people, after Edge Hill's victory tomorrow, will swing to us as massively as they did in 1974. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen. May I just say in conclusion, whatever you may think about one political party or another about our parliamentary system, it seemed to me tonight that in no other country in the world could you bring down a government with such good temper and good humor. Robert McKenzie. Thank you, Robin. A quick recap on dates. Uh, on Tuesday the 3rd, a budget was been brought in. It can't now be a budget. It must be a simple set of resolutions to continue taxation on us. Otherwise, taxation would run out on the 5th of May, and we've got to go on being taxed, so it can't be a full budget. Earliest possible election date, 26th of April. I think it's improbably early, but it makes all kinds of complications because Easter comes in there, and I think it'd be very difficult. The trouble with the 3rd of May, the next most likely date, is that it is actually local government election day. Now, that can be the day when uh, the national election, too, but there are complications. I think the 10th is most likely. Some thought that Jim might try to spin it out to the 7th of June, and I'm told that if he did what Gladstone did in 1886, he could spin it out to the 7th of June. He could then have it doubling up with the European elections. Remember, we may be asked to vote three times in five weeks if they are spread out, and this would be doubling up. October's now out. Well, now, what's her task? Mrs. Thatcher's task is she's going to unseat the government. She needs to do this. Here's the position at the October 74 election. She needs to leap over the third and fourth parties with a 3% swing to get a minimum of one majority or a 4% swing to get a 20-seat majority. Now, nothing mysterious about swing, by the way. It's simply a matter of four out of 100 net shifting sides. And that's what she needs. Now, you say, that sounds easy, but it's happened only once since the war. Only once since the war has a party got a 4% swing. That was Ted Heath in 1970. So that's the task Mrs. Thatcher faces. Uh, doesn't sound difficult, but it's complicated to get a 4% swing and a 20-seat majority, which would last a parliament. If Jim got a swing of even one, he's got a working majority of 30. If one of us net in 100 shifts over that way, you do get the possibility of a Labour majority of 30. That's why the task facing the Tories is obviously bigger than the task facing Labour, but after five years of Labour rule, of course, the opposition are favourites. And if the opinion polls are right, and they've often been wrong before, often been wrong before, Mrs Thatcher should get it. Back to Donald.
And uh, before we leave you tonight, let us uh, remind you of the overall figures once again. The Conservatives and their allies in the lobbies tonight got 311 votes. The government and their allies got 310. And we have been able to tell you, uh, give you a breakdown of how those figures came about. For the government, in the government lobby, there were 303 Labour voters, that, allowing for tellers who count up the votes, that's the, that was uh, one less than their full voting strength, which I'll come back to in a moment. There were two Scottish Labour Party MPs, three Welsh Nats, we knew that was happening before the vote today, and two Ulster Unionists in the government lobby. For the opposition, there were 279 Conservatives, that was their full voting strength, allowing for their two tellers, 13 Liberals, all the Liberals, all the Scottish Nationalists, 11 of them, and eight Ulster Unionists. There were three abstentions in this crucial division tonight, including Mr. <coughs> Frank McGuire, the independent Republican MP from Ireland, Northern Ireland, and Jerry Fitt. We can also confirm that uh, Labour didn't pull their full, their full strength tonight because, in fact, uh, Mr. Brown, one of their MPs, had been sick all day and wasn't able to vote. And since the final margin was only one vote, I don't suppose there's the hardest-hearted Tory in the land who could restrain perhaps a pang of sympathy for Mr. Brown tonight. So there you are, we've had that historical re historic result. For the first time in over 50 years, a government has been forced into a general election by a vote in the House of Commons, and Mr. Callaghan toppled from office by the narrowest possible margin. However, as Winston Churchill used to say, and as someone was recalling only in this afternoon's debate, majority of one is enough. And so we now move into a general election, which uh, may not be as soon as possible, but which Mr. Callaghan says he will announce the date of as soon as possible. But uh, finally, before we say goodnight for tonight, let us remind you that the first electoral contest following tonight's decision in the House of Commons will come, in fact, tomorrow with the by-election at Liverpool Edge Hill. All the parties, major and minor, perhaps especially Mr John Pardo, will now be watching the outcome there more closely than ever, and so will we. Tonight we started early, and tomorrow we'll be staying on late to bring you the declaration of that result and the first political reactions to it. We'll, we hope you'll join us then again. Until then, from all of us here at Central Hall Westminster, a very good night. Thank <laughs> you.